Good morning and welcome into the Morning Burrito. I am Michael. I am Eric. We have burritos. Burritos. I can't believe you did this today. Although they, they call them wraps. They're not... I, let's look really? at these things. I, I mean, this does not look like what I would call a burrito. It smells burned. These these are not burritos in my opinion. But I mean, hey, thank you to Starbucks for that, I guess. And we've got... We've got food, and we've got drink. You know, it, it doesn't really matter what this is, because you actually stopped, and you went out of your way to pick it up today. So thank you. And you got an extra hot I know. venti extra Americano. And big. Big. You did. You went all out. It's it, like you almost want something. Yeah, you said that earlier. I did. But, but you never said you didn't want anything, so. I didn't say that I didn't want anything, but no. I, <clears throat> I I bristled at the fact that you would even suggest that I would do something nice I know, for I you. I know. I know. You're, just, you're a sweetie. you I got know. a tender side to you that people don't normally see, probably. So we were just talking about uh, fishing, fishing, and life being out of balance, and how fishing wow. brings us back into a balanced state. Yeah, it's been like a couple weeks. Since are you I've moving been us into like yoga? Like, are we going to talk about yoga and you someday know, oneness and one? No. Yes, we will. We will, but not today. That's not today's topic. <laughs> so tell me, uh, when are you going fishing? Because I mean, the weather's starting to get nice here in Oregon, and it's time for uh, fishing to open. Dude, it's Holy Week. It's coming up on Holy Week. I don't have time to get out fishing. Yeah. You know, my mother-in-law, she sent a text yesterday, Okay. and she's asking me, when am I coming over to go fishing uh, with my father-in-law? And uh, I've been trying to do that, and I was like, oh, I can't, blah, blah, blah. Just, uh, I can't get there before Easter. And uh, she said, oh, that's okay. Uh, fishing for men should be the priority. And I'm like, <laughs> no. Well, but yes. I mean, how do I you love, say no to that? I love that your, your mother-in-law is telling you this as a, you know, since you're a pastor, <laughs> as if you, as if I don't know, as if you don't know, right? <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, you know what? Nice job. Yeah. Nice job. Elaine, right? Who? Is it Elaine? Evelyn. Evelyn, man, I was close. I Elaine, was Elaine was somebody else's mother-in-law. Oh, I'm sure it's not mine. <laughs> I was close though. Hey, at least I had the E. I've, he, o- I've only met her twice, I think, or three is, times. Is Elaine yours? No. <laughs> okay. Just no. make sure you know that. No, mine's Priscilla, who yeah. Likely Priscilla is watching this. So oh, hey, good morning. Hey, mom. Nice to see you. Actually afternoon there in, in Wisconsin. Uh no, it's not said. afternoon. Well well, okay, it is. I Two guess hours. It's, it's noon. So yeah. It's 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 right at yeah, afternoon now. Exactly. It's a lunchtime for you. So you did mention it is, uh, well, not quite yet, but it's coming into Holy Week starting next week. And uh, right. so just just an, uh, as a advertisement, a PSA, okay. whatever you want to call it, okay. uh, for uh, Hermnaz, who... Did you just say PDA? PSA. Oh, PSA. Okay. Public service announcement. Right. I need more coffee. Uh, dude, you have a Vente. I know. Vente. I mean, I'm having... I don't know how it's pronounced. It's... I'm not a coffee drinker. It's coffee PDA. And the only reason the only reason I went to Starbucks is because I had a Starbucks gift card. Thank you. Oh, that's Northwest good. District NYI. There you Appreciate go. Appreciate it. There you go. Um, you worked hard on that this weekend. Tell her about what you did this weekend. Oh, yeah. You did a good job. So before I get to Holy Week? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we had... Uh, okay, time's up. No, just kidding. Go ahead. Uh, our Northwest District for the Church of the Nazarene, we had, uh, we had our what we call Breakthrough Conference. We have it every year for our student ministries across the district, and uh, our district is made up of churches from western Idaho, western and northern Idaho, um, eastern Oregon, and northeastern Oregon, and uh, pretty much the entire eastern half of uh, from the Cascades to the border for Washington. So, um it was it was great. We it was kind of like a quasi virtual event. So we had three churches here at our church uh, together doing the event uh, with Zoom and uh, connecting with our district friends. And so, yeah, it was a great event. Six thirty in the morning for me, all the way till uh, ten p.m. <laughs> so it was a long day, but uh, we had ten kids get saved. Typical work day for a senior pastor. I don't know about that. Just saying. If you count being on your boat fishing and talking to people in the park, that's work. Hey, that's that's a good day then. Yeah. So yeah, it was a good day. We, ten kids got saved. It was it was great. So that's awesome. Yeah, good job. So again, uh, public service announcement for our church: um, If you are listening and you are from the Umatilla County Hermiston area, and you don't have a church home, uh, there is no better time to jump into a church than <clears throat> Easter uh, Holy Week. Uh, it's it's a great time to. You know, encounter God. I mean, a lot of people go to church Easter and Christmas. So now, you know what you just did? What you just cut out everybody who watches us online. 
Why? Well, because I'll put a plug in for those of you that are members of our church in Michigan. Um, that PSA is for you too. And Texas, oh, well, sure, sure. and Florida, um, and uh, South Dakota, uh, and Alaska. I mean, so we have people Wisconsin. all over the watch. Canada. So yeah, uh, you cut your own mother in law out of that one. And my mom. Well, my mom watches. Mom. See, so in Georgia. Yeah. My and sister, your sister, sister in Texas, Texas, right? My friend in New Mexico so watches just, us. I'm just so saying we have we, we have people. All of, but what all I'm saying over. is that there, there, all of those people that I was thinking of, other than your 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 dad and your um, dad's wife, they they are, you know, they are really the only ones I can think of that watch that don't have a church home, in addition to watching our podcast. Am I wrong about that? I don't know. Yeah, you're wrong about that. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That's that's good news. I, yeah. I, I would take that as a win. Now, a year and a half ago before COVID, I'd no. say you're right. <laughs> but since COVID, I mean, we've no, we've got some, Like my family who watches, they have their own church homes and stuff. So anyway, yeah. all that to say, if you don't have a church home online, live stream, of course, or in person, you, we are available to you. And... Uh, our online campus is great, and we are we are improving every day with that. But no, we have uh, this coming Sunday is Palm what? Sunday. I, I, I got I can't hold this in. Oh my gosh, go! <laughs> so the online people, um, church I should say, um, love you to death. Um, but when I talk to most, not most, but several of them, like during the week, mm-hmm. um, oh pastor, it was great, great to uh, be part of our church on Sunday. Um, I watched uh, right after. Uh, uh, Andy Stanley, uh, I went to him first, and then I went to, um, oh, who's the other dude? Stephen um, Furtick, or no, um, older guy. Um, oh, David, uh, David, uh, David Jeremiah. Oh, <laughs> and then well, and then you. Those are my three, my three pastors, and I'm like, I mean, I am like, I'm up there. That's, <laughs> and then no, that's not really the attitude. The attitude is like, really. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so, again. <laughs> Palm Sunday, it's coming this this coming Sunday, and Palm Sunday is always a great. Uh, there's a great there's bacon in this. There is, and there's there's sausage in there. Yeah, at least they're supposed to be. Um, so ten thirty a.m. on Sunday morning, be with us for Palm Sunday. Uh, then we of course have Good Friday service. Uh, we're mm-hmm. calling it the Good Friday Experience. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen on a Good Friday. I can promise you that. Uh, I'm proud of us. Actually, I think we came up with a creative new experience um, for a Good Friday. It's something that neither one of us have ever done or experienced ourselves. So. Yeah, and people people that are part of our Hermanas family, they're used to us being something a little bit different, but this is this is different. I mean, this is definitely different. So be there on Good Friday, uh, 6 o'clock, um, 7 o'clock. I don't remember our time. Check out the website. <laughs> yeah, check our website, hermistonnazarene.org, for that. Uh, and then, of course, we have sunrise service at 7 a.m. on Sunday morning. Uh, mm-hmm. Great opportunity. Uh, and it's only online. It's only online. It's mm-hmm. Facebook Live mm-hmm. um, on our church's Facebook page. Um, and then uh, 10.30 a.m. for our uh, family ce- Easter celebration. And again, the cool thing is Palm Sunday, uh, all the way through to Easter Sunday, you want to be a part of all of them. They all have a connection to each other. Um, it tells the story of what Jesus did and what he went through his last week of life. And so um, you want to be a part of all of them. If you can help not missing any, don't miss them. Be a part. Be at Palm Sunday. Be at Good Friday, sunrise service, and uh, Easter Sunday service. You're not going to want to miss any of it. And right. then also, if you're in town, if you are in town um, and you got young kids... We're doing a really cool thing this year with COVID. It's 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 hard to do a normal, typical Easter egg hunt type of thing here on the church property, but um, we do have the op- op- option or opportunity. Uh, you can register online at our website, and uh, we will have people bring eggs to your house and hide them for your kids so that your kids can have an Easter egg hunt Sunday morning yeah, uh, really before cool. they come to church, which is a really neat thing. I, you guys did that for my family last week, or last year, not last week, last year, and uh, my older daughter, man, that was, she was so surprised. She had no idea that was coming, so that was that was awesome for her. Yeah, so parents, that, that's a surprise for your kids. Yeah, don't so, tell your kids it's going to happen. Um, but you have to register online. It's very important, because if you don't register and fill the card out, you're, you're not getting eggs. So, I mean, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, but it gives us 
that like to be kind of stealthy at night and kind of, you know, feel like we're out there being kind of gangster about stuff. It gives us the opportunity to do that. Yeah, you kind of so. scared me last year because I had no idea you guys were coming to my house. It's great. And all of a sudden I hear people rustling in my front yard in the middle of the, it was like 10 o'clock and 9 o'clock at night. Thanks so. for not shooting us. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, but let me just say too on this, on the whole Easter thing, even though it all ties together and you can't make one of them, still come because you're, oh, sure. you're not, you're not going to be out of the story. No. I mean, You'll, and of you'll, course, you'll figure out the storyline. So everything we do is online, so you can always go back and watch. So if you can't make Palm Sunday, right? You know, if you're out with family this weekend or whatever, watch it before you come to Good Friday. If you can't make Good Friday, watch it online before you come on Sunday morning. I mean, there's always that option of being a part, even if you're not there physically, yep. or not watching it in the moment. So, all right, well, hey, let's get into our episode. Uh, it is episode twenty. How cool is that? Man. Again, five months worth of shows now. It's crazy. It's hard to believe. And we're still doing it. Yeah. And it's fun. It's still as fun as it was the day, first day. And I think we're getting better. I think so. I think, yeah. You know, we still haven't had uh, the technology upgrades yet to be able to, like, have our stuff on the screen. No. But, I mean, we've got a cool on-air sign. I know. We've got our beautiful morning burrito logo it's sign, beautiful. which is great. Uh, it makes We have stuff that Andy Stanley does not. Well, we have the morning burrito. And I mean, the sign. Well, I mean... He does not have a sign. He doesn't? No. Well, he's not as cool as we are. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Too bad for Andy Stanley. Yeah. yeah. Take that. Yeah. He could learn something from us. Com- compare. So so today, um, our show is all about Easter. We're gonna we're really gonna talk about the passion story uh, from a different angle, but we're gonna we're gonna go through um, go through that because you know we're not gonna be we're not gonna be online next week with you guys. Uh, we're gonna take the week off. Taking it off. Not really taking it off. I mean, we we just have a lot to prepare for for our church here and um, for Holy Week. So uh, we'll be back with you the week after Easter. But um, but let's let's get into it. Uh, the title of today's episode is "The Power and the Blindness of the Palm Branches." And, and so to get us started, if you don't know, uh, you can go into uh, the Gospels and you can see the the story. I think I think it's. The triumphal entries in all four Gospels, yep. uh, it's d- talked about differently in all four, but I mean, the it's talked about in all of them. Mm-hmm. Triumphal entry, uh, just to kind of encapsulate what it is, Jesus has been ministering for three years at this point. Uh, you know, Jesus is a 30-something-year-old guy, uh, 33-year-old guy at this point. He's a stud. Um, he's, he's kind of a, a wandering preacher. <laughs> I guess the only way to talk about it is almost preacher, and uh, he's got these these dirty, smelly guys following him in the dirt. And uh, Jesus knows they don't know this, but Jesus knows this is the last week of his life that he is beginning his last week on earth. And um, so Jesus decides, I'm going to go to Jerusalem for my last week. That's where I need to be um, because I'm going to spend the last week on earth. And so he sends these guys ahead, right? And he he has them get him a donkey, which seems a little odd. We'll talk about that, about that I'm sure. But he gets the don- has them get the donkey, bring it to him. And Jesus enters into Jerusalem uh on a donkey. Uh these weird people are waving palm branches, which to us in the 21st century doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why would, you know, what, what is the significance of a palm branch being waved? All of that. Uh, saying this weird word, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Again, a word we don't quite understand unless we are biblical people. Um, and then it's literally like five days later, they put the guy on a cross. They crucify him. They beat him within, his, an, in, be within an inch of his life before that, before they crucify him. It's an amazing turn of events in a matter of days, mm-hmm. <laughs> where Jesus starts and where he finishes that week. Um, and then, of course, there's the following Sunday, which we'll get to at the end. But mm-hmm. so, so, spoiler alert: just, Jesus, Jesus is alive. <laughs> wow, you threw that in there. Sorry, I had save to. the ending. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, 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 so just as quickly as things change in Jesus's story, here here's one way that it relates to our our culture here today. If we were to look over the last like short period of time for our own culture, look how quickly things have changed, mm. right? Um, we've, we've gone from a culture of loving 
one another and supporting one another too. And whatever your viewpoint on that is, I mean, this is not a systemic political show, but you've you've changed uh, our culture has changed to where, I mean, hatred is like almost the number one thing, right? So. So anyway, so we'll get there in this podcast maybe on, on some of that. But but the correlation between then and now, huge, just even on that that level. So um, but there is there is a difference between the power and the blindness of the palm branches. Um, two things um, that just stick out. Um, so we want to talk about that a little bit because uh, I don't think we really understand what the palm tree or the palm branches are really all about and the significance of that. And uh, so if you don't know much about the Easter story, maybe uh, keep tuning in and you'll you'll hear maybe something. So let's let's get into the the power side of things yeah. before we get into blindness. So mm-hmm. everybody, I think, if you don't know what a palm branch looks like, look it up online. It's it's we should have brought one today. We should have. Didn't. Oh well. Um but a palm branch is a long palm frond is like a long branch with these long leaves on them that go out like that kind of makes like a spear looking shape. Um, palm trees, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, I might be wrong about this, but in the desert, they are probably <laughs> a pretty common tree. Yes, no? Uh, it, well, it was back then. I mean, for us here in the States, it kind of depends on your desert. Um, not in our desert. Not in our desert. If we saw a palm tree here, which there are some, but they're you know they're transported. <laughs> I was going to say they weren't. A, they aren't native here. <laughs> not native. Now, Arizona, tons of palm trees, but they came from California. Um, so I mean, yeah. And there are different types of palm trees. There are, and I don't think they uh, were into the the moving of palm trees and shipping them in and all that back in Jesus' day. But maybe I don't know. What is uh, in, in Jesus's time? You know the the first century of uh, AD or CE, however you define time at this point. Um, how did they view the palm tree? So the palm tree, the, the, I mean, there's power in the palm tree. The palm tree was significant in their economic drive. I mean, they're, they they. The palm tree meant money. Um, they would cut the palm tree down, and they'd use every part of it um, to build houses, uh, for uh, it, furniture. Um, they would build for their their tools and their equipment. Um, I mean, so there's there's a lot of significance to the palm tree. Um, and is w- it true that they use the palm fronds? I mean, I know the Catholic Church uses them now. Many churches use them for Ash Wednesday and mm-hmm. things. But didn't they use the palm fronds in... Uh, the temple. Um, Hence why we have Ash Wednesday. Didn't they, didn't they burn? Maybe I'm totally making that up in my brain, but I, I seem to remember somewhere in my yeah. history class that they, they, they burn used, them, but then they would keep the ash for a year and they'd use them. There's significance in, in that. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what else they would use it for though. Um, guess we should have looked that up. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there is, there is significance in the temple. Um, Burn it, keep the ash for a year, and then they use it the next year uh, as part of the the Passover. Um, but but the the palm tree itself in, in the branches, I mean, you don't just go waste them. Um, you don't like here we got the Russian olive tree, and it's like that's like the trash tree. I mean, cut it down, get rid of it. You can't burn it because it stinks. Uh, I mean, you can, but it just ugh, it's gross. It's got these deadly sticker. Thorns all over it, just not even. You get stu- you've been stuck with one of those, man. Your skin's gonna itch and swell up and turn red. Um, it's like it's like almost the tree from hell. Um, I know I know a lot of people have allergies to it. They, yeah, when they bloom, when they bloom, it's horrible it makes them. But know. see, they're not native here either. They were transported in. They built. The, do you know why they did that? You know why they transported these ugly trees in here? I have no idea. Let me give you a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, senseless, non-important information. Yeah, this is one of the first things I said to you when I got it, it out was, of here. It was. It was. You're full um, of useless information. You, you, that's the word, useless information. Um, when they were building the dam, there's this huge influx of people coming in, and they needed to, uh, uh, from what I'm told anyway, um, they started importing these things even before then for erosion. So there you have it. That's why it started. They have a strong root structure. Yeah. 
So it started along the riverbanks, and now look, I live I live out in the country. They're all over the place. But anyway. I honestly can say I don't know what they look like. <laughs> I don't know that I've seen one. Since we'll go on a here. walk later today. <laughs> all okay. these here behind the church, all Russian olive. Hmm. So now you know. Okay. So, but uh, but you know you don't just go cut down a palm a palm tree. I mean, because it, it was it was significant. If you had a palm tree, you you had an investment. You may not have any money. You may not have uh, you know food uh, in the in the cooler. Um, but at the same time, if you had a palm tree, you knew you had at least some pennies that you could get if you needed them. So, mm-hmm. um, but it was also oops sorry a um, a driver uh, in celebration. Um, you know when they have big festivities, it was it was. It was huge if you were show if you were asked to show up with the palm branches mm-hmm. uh, for either decoration, um, if it was for a, a gift, um, it was huge uh, to give as a gift. Um, and in the royal court, uh, palm branches, and we've all seen the movies, you know, with the king laying down. He's got one. He's got one. You know, woman over here fanning him. You know, with the palm branch. The other one feeding him the grapes. You know, I mean, that, that sounds was, like a great life. Actually, it, it does. It does. <laughs> I'm taking palm branches home. I need to tell my wife. <laughs> we ordered some for Palm Sunday, so I might have to snag one. I have my wife fan me, and my daughter give me grapes. <laughs> and Claire just sucking on your toes. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds kind of gross. It actually, gross. I don't anyway. know where that came from. <laughs> um, so, so even in the royal court, it, there's there's this this hierarchy. Of, of thought when it comes to the palm branches because it's it's for a a higher echelon of people um so so it, it drove that and then you know when the king came in uh after a battle um they uh they would wave palm branches we'll get to there here in a, in a minute but so basically it's for victory is what you're saying victory mm-hmm. victory and power yeah victory okay. and power so so then we fast forward that into <clears throat> we're talking about Jesus entering Jerusalem, mm-hmm. Palm Sunday. Again, as I said last week, Christians really creative with our names for different events. Palm Sunday, the Sunday in which palm branches were used. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was on a Sunday, but yeah. Well, so Jesus comes into town, and all these people line the streets, and they do two things. Uh, well, three things. They say... They say the word or the phrase Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, which means save us, save us. Okay, so it actually means save now. So, so they are declaring that Jesus is a savior, a, a king, a, a rescuer, right? Hopeful, right? And then they're waving palm branches, which we've talked about the power and the royalty aspect, expensive aspect of that, and they're. Everybody lining the street has these, and they're waving them in the air. Well, not everybody has them. I mean, I think that's one thing in Scripture. Um, we we've we've been raised that everybody has palm branches, right? Even in church, we make as a kid, everybody, everybody had, had a palm branch on Palm Sunday to wave, and that's not Scripture. Scripture says, if I can find it here, uh, it's in Matthew twenty one verse eight. It says most of the crowd spread cloaks. So not everybody had palm branches. So what's the deal with the cloaks? So so the cloak is you are giving your I mean you're given you're given everything. I mean your your cloak is something that uh, people they didn't have a whole lot of wardrobe, right? I mean they they didn't have a closet like we have today where it's shoes and and, and clothes. Um, they had a cloak, maybe two cloaks. They had a ceremonial cloak. They had a death cloak. Um, then they had their work cloak. That's about all they had. I mean, that that's that's it. Uh, women, they'd have their go to market, you know, stuff that they'd they'd wear to market. But um, so laying the cloak out is, man, I am I am giving this man that I either know or don't know, but this is I'm giving you everything I have. It's out of respect. It's out of it's out of uh, humility. But it's also, hey, notice me, notice me. Look at what I'm giving you, right? Yep. Um, I'm do, prostrating myself in front of you. Yeah. I'm offering myself to you. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when we call it the triumphal entry, that is a really uh, useful and accurate term for what was going on. They, they, 
they believed that there was a triumphant king mm-hmm. entering into Jerusalem, a, a king that was going to remove the Romans, that was going to end their oppression that they were under. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. Um, even though they didn't know, uh, most of the people on the on the street that day, they didn't know Jesus. Right. Um, they probably hadn't heard of Jesus. Uh, maybe they, they, I mean, they didn't have social him. media, so they didn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So it's not like right. there was Twitter. You know. Uh, right. Twitter uh, tweets going out about right. this Jesus character. I mean, this is all word of mouth at at best. Right. So so here's I mean, just the whole concept of being triumphal. Right. Entry. When the king would go out to war and come back with a victory, that word was spread back to J Town, um, and it J-Town's spread Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It, it, thanks. Um, it, it was spread to the people that hey, we have a victory. So the king comes leading in on his white horse, and on his sash, you know, it's it's marked with victory. And as he comes running in, the parade of people would come out. Uh, into the street outside the city wall and greet the king with palm branches, significant of um, the power um, of what just happened. And then they would spread their cloaks as, man, notice me, king. <laughs> um, I am I am paying you tribute. I am giving you honor and and glory and praise and I mean, but but look at me. If right? you've seen the movie Troy, Troy is a mm-hmm. good example of this, even though mm-hmm. there's no cloaks being thrown on the ground, but there are palm branches being waved. And Troy is a Greek. Uh, the whole movie Troy is about the Greek uh, 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 book or, or novel uh, written by Homer, uh, the Odyssey or the Iliad, whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's this sort of fictional but sort of not fictional take on what took place between Sparta and Troy. Anyway, when the sons return, you see this triumphal Mm. entry of the sons of Troy coming home from their time with Sparta. It's the exact same thing. This was a this was a common practice in that time and place. And I mean, we still see it to a certain extent today when Harry and Meghan got married and when William and uh uh Man, I'm gonna yeah mess up her name. I don't remember uh, the other princess. Um, when they got married, there was a tri- there was this triumphal parade, right? You mm-hmm. know, to celebrate the new prince and princess, you know, married and all this stuff. That's that's still a monarchy thing today. I mm-hmm. mean, that's how we treat kings <clears throat> and queens today, and princes and princesses. I mean, this is just how we treat uh, royalty. So. Now let's let's begin to turn here a little bit. I think there's some irony in all of this, right? So the people are reacting this way, right? The people are excited that Jesus is coming to town. Um, I, I would imagine that you know Jesus has been around for three years as a as a minister at this point, as a as a pastor, as a preacher, um, and I'm sure that you know because of the things that Jesus had been doing throughout his time in ministry, I'm sure word had gotten around about this this Nazarene who was doing some, you know, ridiculously amazing things. But there was still a group of people that were not excited that Jesus was coming into town. Mm-hmm. They did not believe that he was going to be the Savior King, as the, the, the common folk did. Can you talk to that just briefly? Who, who were the people that were not excited Jesus was coming into town? Well, I think, I think you have three, three group of people. That were um, there along that trail, or at least on the hillside, because you know where Jesus came in with the triumphal entry, right? Um, it's outside of the Jerusalem Wall, the Eastern Gate, where Scripture says when He returns, He's going to return back to that Eastern Gate. Um, so, so and the Eastern Gate um, is on a hillside. So along the uh, along the the walls of Jerusalem, uh, and scattered throughout the crowd, I'm sure, um, were the religious leaders. Um, and the Pharisees and and some of the scholars that that just did not want this man um, to come in because he's going to turn everything upside down, which we know that he did. Um, so so you have the you have the religious leaders and the the scholars. You've got the Roman court um, that you know are not at all in favor of a Jew leading anything. Um, 
and uh, because the only king, you know, there's only one room for one ruler, and Jesus wasn't it. And, and then you, you've got a group of people in, along the road that are just caught up in the crowd. They don't know what is going on. They're waiting for the king to come back, so they're come with their palm branches. I mean, word has spread that, man, there's this victory, there's a triumphal entry happening, there's this event that's taking place, so... Man, they go grab their cloak, they go grab their palm branches, and they come out. They have no idea. They're probably the people going to work, just doing their normal daily routine. Just and driving down the road, like, going like, Have you ever been happening? caught, like, and there's a parade that you didn't know about, or there's a, you know, we're not speaking about the protest, but if there's a protest and you're on your way to work and you get caught, you know, and there's people on the road or whatever, no matter what they're protesting, and you're like, Oh, come on, I got to get to work. I'm sure yeah. there were there were several of those people. Yeah. But... Talking about the Roman court, we know that Pilate hit one of his fears was insurrection, right? Mm-hmm. So his his fear was unruliness. He didn't yeah. he because he did not want to I mean, because if he screws up, Caesar has him killed, like mm-hmm. he's done. So uh so for Pilate as the governor, the Roman uh governor of that area mm-hmm. of Judea. Um, his only concern is keeping the peace. And yeah, because so he see, knew there was power in the Jewish culture that could overturn the whole... There's only so many Romans that were there. Yeah. I so, mean, it's not like... Having said that, though, I mean, let's be real. The Jews probably weren't going to do much against the Roman soldiers. Well, they had been enslaved for so long and oppressed for so long. The Romans had advanced technology when it came to warfare they had and swords. stuff. Yeah, well, they have more than swords. They did. But anyway, so, okay, so those are the groups. Well, let's talk mm-hmm. about the blindness then. Where does the blindness come in for the palm branches? You know, we have we have this triumphal entry. Where does the blindness come in now? So, so the blindness, I think, comes into that, that, that group of people that were in the crowd uh, that day along that along the path that just got caught up in it. Um, either they they had no idea who Jesus was, Right. So they're blind to this guy coming in on a donkey, and they start questioning. Well, what am I doing here? I don't, I don't know anything about this guy. I don't have any way to support him. I, so they start, they start the murmur in in the crowd of, right. uh, why are we doing this? But then you got the people um, that I think were truly blind. Um, they were the people that had seen Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They had, you know, maybe first or second hand account, maybe third hand account from family members that maybe have crossed paths with Jesus or crossed paths with somebody who Jesus healed or touched. Um, so they, they they knew. They knew that Jesus was was legit. Legit. But they were blind because they thought he was coming to uh take care of all the uh social justice issues in their culture, all the oppression, all the homeless, all the blind, all the sick, all those that needed healing, all those with leprosy, coming to save the prostitutes, coming to, you know, even uh, rule the church itself. Mm. Um, And they saw him on a donkey, and they start thinking, Where's the uh, white horse? Where's the sword? Where's, yeah, we're, I'm giving you everything I have right here. Um, But really, on on a donkey? Jesus, you look humble? Um, Jesus doesn't look like he could, you know, swat a fly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, compared to what uh, typically happens at a triumphal entry, right? Here's this meek little little guy. There's no armor. There's no there's no sword. There's no huge entourage. Um, but the irony is that they f- soon find out that's not the case, right? They, they do. So Jesus, shortly after the triumphal entry, Jesus goes into the temple, and Jesus becomes very, very upset, mm-hmm. right? And Jesus does something that we really don't see any other time in the gospel accounts of his life. My grandma would say he got his dander up. Yeah, I mean, he. You know, we always talk about that phrase, righteous anger. Mm-hmm. Jesus had righteous anger here, and Jesus goes in, and you hear, I mean, what we could describe as violent. I mean, it was not calm. It was not peaceful in right. any way. I mean, so anyone anyone's watching this who has said the phrase or something like Jesus was a pacifist, no. No. Jesus was not a pacifist. Jesus was not peaceful all the time. Um, by this account, we know that's not true. Jesus goes into the temple, and it says that he overturns tables and and basically runs these these what they call money changers out of the temple, gets them to leave. Uh, 
I can only imagine that that made the Pharisees, the religious leaders, more angry, right? Because that's a cash cow for them. They're they're getting a kickback, I imagine, from those guys. Um, and then those people that were just kind of there at the triumphal entry, they're probably looking at this and being like, uh, okay, why is he attacking us? You know, because those are their brethren, right? right. Those are Jews that right. are in the temple. So, why aren't you? Why are you attacking us and not the Romans? Like, what is, what is going on here? I, I would imagine that's where things began to turn for Jesus um, in the pub, court of public opinion. Uh, Jesus was not the the savior king that they thought they were going to be getting. Right. But look look at how that correlates in today's culture. Even I mean. Scripture says that um, in the last days, evil is going to be good, good is going to be evil, and that the enemy, the devil, has blinded um, the culture to where they can't see. Um, and that's where I think part of the blindness comes in, is they were no different in their culture than we are in our culture. Um, they couldn't see. They knew what they you know, didn't want to happen. Um, they wanted to live their own life. They wanted to do things that they like to do, and that felt good to them. Right. But look at, I mean, just in all seriousness, the correlation between Jesus in the temple and what's going on in the temple today. I mean, we have all kinds of different beliefs, false beliefs, false gods, false leaders that are speaking in the evangelical church, that are speaking things that are against the holiness of, um, that is taught in the Bible. I don't know who I heard say this. It, it was very recent. Um, I was listening to a pastor or a church leader, and they were talking about the golden calf story mm. from uh, the time of Moses. Moses. It was probably Andy Stanley. Uh, no. I'm just kidding. I'm yeah, just it kidding. Stanley. kidding. I, don't, I don't remember who it was, to be honest. But uh, So I would give attribution to this, but I don't remember who it was. Um, but they were talking about the golden calf story, and if you don't know the golden calf story, it's real briefly, the... Israel, the Israelites have just left, uh, have just been ex, gone through the Exodus. They're they're they've left Egypt. They're running in the desert. They're in the wilderness. It's you know a, probably a very difficult time for all of them. I, I would imagine being in the desert for forty days probably stinks a lot. Um, but Moses has gone up to the mountain and he's talking to God, and they're alone alone for days. And so they tell Aaron, his brother, "Hey, uh, we need this golden calf. We need, we need, we need an idol to worship, essentially." And uh, Aaron, being the idiot that he was, he's like, "Oh yeah, well, let's do that. Give me all your gold, and I'll make a golden calf." And so out comes this idol, the golden calf. And uh, long story short, Moses comes down. Big problem. The golden calf is destroyed. It's you know God is very angry, so on and so forth. In the church today, to speak to what you were pointing out, there's a lot of golden calves today mm -hmm. in the church. There are a lot of things that we put on this pedestal at the same level or even above the level of Christ himself. And mm -hmm. we don't want to admit that. I mean, there's... <laughs> I don't think any Christian would easily admit that they have a golden calf in their life, but I guarantee that in the church we have lots of golden calves um, you know, our political standing would be one golden calf that I think, mm -hmm. no matter if you're on the right side or the left side of the political spectrum, there's a golden calf when it comes to politics. Um, you know, we have seriously made the the po political landscape a golden calf in and of itself. I mean, look at how we treat the president. It's like the president's a king, which was exactly what we weren't supposed to be doing in this country. Mm -hmm. We didn't want a king, right? Um you know the way we treat music, the way we treat preachers. I've seen people leave a church, even if a piece, even if a pastor leaves under good terms. Well, I can't be at that church without that pastor there, so I'm going to go find another church. What? <laughs> right. So, right. so we are just as fickle today as the point. We are just as <laughs> we, silly today as we were then. We even have golden golden calves. We call them golden plaques. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like like the organ was donated by. In memory of so and so, yeah, right. And I don't think we have a Bertha in our church, so it was it was donated by Bertha. In this pew, Bertha, and you can't anyway. you can't now get rid of that piece because it was right. donated in memory of so right. and so. And the, you know that that is a golden calf because you know that 
maybe it prevents you from moving mm-hmm. forward in your church. So if but, you're a pastor and listening to that, that's something you need to consider, I would think. Right. But but look but look at this in that story though, in relation to what we're talking about today, um, Aaron would not have done that if Moses had been on the scene. Correct. Right. So because Moses wouldn't have allowed it. Right. So here we are in Jerusalem with Jesus. He's coming in. The people are doing the things that Aaron would have done, right? But when Jesus showed up, done, right? There's a spiritual leader, a spiritual mentor that refuses to allow things to creep into his church and affect his bride, which Scripture says church is his bride. Um, and that's that's where today, Easter, and this Holy Week, um, we need to remember that there's power and there's blindness in Easter because in our culture today, no different than in Jesus' day, we have a a group in probably every church where there is uh, a need for a spiritual leader to keep um, to keep the gate right. Yeah, and that's that's our role as pastors. Uh, that's my role as a lead pastor. Mm-hmm. I am the keeper of the gate. And you know what? If you're a senior pastor and you're watching, can I just encourage you today? Um, do not be afraid to lay down in front of the uh, of, of the gate, um, yeah. just like a shepherd, because you are the keeper of the gate. And it's okay for you to say no to some things. Yeah, and, and part of the shepherd's role is to take on the wolves. Take them on. Take on the bears. Take on the lions. You know, when they, when they come, I mean, we look at David's life, and this is David's story— Full of him being mm-hmm. a good shepherd and taking care of those animals that were coming to devour his flock. That is our role. So don't be a coward. It's I mean, not fun. Yeah. But I mean, again, I, I, this is harsh words, but don't be a coward. Stand up for Christ, stand up for scripture, stand up for truth. Because whether you like to admit this or not, whether you want to believe this or not, there is truth. There is. Re- th- my truth, that whole phrase is silly to me. There is no such thing as my truth or your truth or his truth or her truth. Right. It's truth. There's either truth or not It's truth. absolute or it's not. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. there are things that are gray area for sure. There are things in this world that are not black and white. But having said that, there is truth. And as pastors, it is our responsibility to speak truth, speak life into people. And so as we look at the Easter story, one of the things that has has frustrated me, maybe it doesn't frustrate you, but we tend to act as though Easter Sunday is, is, is special, and it is, but we forget that every Sunday is Easter Sunday right. for the church. Right. So, so <laughs> where I think we we want to encourage pastors today is it is every Sunday that it is Easter. And because it's every Sunday that's Easter, um, you may have to say no as a shepherd hmm. because you have to protect the cross. You have to protect the tomb. I mean, the tombs where the victory was won. Right. I mean, we want to say all you, I mean, say all you want to, the cross is where the victory is won. The cross is where sin was forgiven. But the victory was won when the when the battle was done in hell and the tomb was empty. Yeah, you know the the irony is that Jesus goes from this this tree, this palm tree with power and glory and honor, and he's relegated to the, then a few days later this tree of cr- cruelty, of uh, brutality, of evil. But if that's where the story ended, it'd be real sad. The right. truth again is. That isn't the end. There is hope. There is glory. Um, Jesus was the Savior King. I, ironically, you know, these people were blind to the reality. They were right at first. <laughs> they, right. They were actually correct. Uh, you know, the irony of it took Pilate putting that Jesus King of the Jews up on Jesus's cross. He declared who Jesus was. Didn't even know that's what he was doing, but he was right. declaring who Jesus actually was. Right. Gave him the name tag. Gave him a name tag, right? On his cross. We can't use name tags in church. <laughs> well. <laughs> so hadn't really thought of that until just now. <laughs> it's kind of good. I'm gonna use that someday. There you go. Um so Jesus, Jesus was the conquering king. Did he come and destroy the Romans? No. Of course not. We know actually shortly after Jesus' death, just a few, what, 70 years later or so, 40 years later, um, 
the temple was destroyed by right. the Romans. I mean, they 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 basically said we've had enough of these Jews, right. and so yeah, it's if you're not a pastor and you're watching this today, which I would imagine most of the people who are watching this are not pastors, um, based on our previous viewership at this mm-hmm. point. Um, Love your pastors, but also understand that your pastors have a role, and sometimes that is to say no to us. And, and sometimes saying no, people say, well, you know what, pastor, you just don't love us. <laughs> you are closed-minded. Well, listen, because I'm the keeper of the gate of what happened in Jerusalem and, and what happened at Golgotha mm-hmm. and, and what happened um, in the garden you know, with the open tomb, um, saying no is... I think what Jesus did in the temple, it's tough love. Yeah. And you know what happened that day? People left the church. Oh, yeah. People stopped following Jesus. But you know what Jesus did? I'm okay with that. It breaks my heart, but this is unacceptable. And I think at Easter time, especially when we're in Holy Week, the whole idea and the premise of the cross is to go and say, you're wrong, repent. Forgiveness is yours, and if you don't, the, well, the life abundant is not for you. And, and remember, too, just to, just this is my closing words, I guess. Jesus had twelve dudes that walked with him everywhere for three years, pretty much, right? Well, eleven. Well, no, but he had twelve. <laughs> yeah, and even even in that twelve, you had one who completely betrayed him, sold him mm-hmm. out from thirty pieces of silver, right? You had another guy who. Even after Jesus' death on the cross, after seeing Jesus go through the brutality of the murder that he endured, the execution he endured, Thomas still didn't believe. Right. Thomas still had a hard time. After all the things that he had seen, he had raised Lazarus from the dead, all of these things, and Thomas still had a hard time believing right. that Jesus was who he said he was. It, didn't, it wasn't until Thomas saw him after the resurrection and put his hands in right. Jesus' wrists and feet and side and whatever— that and, Thomas and, was like, Peter, okay, I believe now. <laughs> and Peter was, hey, poor me, kind of thing. And until Jesus showed up along the trail, right? Well, and Peter was the one that, you know, Jesus is, he, he, Jesus is being arrested, and he grabs his sword and he cuts the soldier's ear yeah, off, yeah. and you know, he's he's oh, Mister Tough Guy. And then Jesus is in the the or the temple court, and he's being he's on trial, and this little girl says to him, hey, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? Oh, no, no, not me, not me. That's not me, not this not this guy. And he denies Jesus three times, mm-hmm. this, tough, this tough guy, Peter. So if you're beating yourself up, don't. Okay, right. Even the guys closest to Jesus didn't get it right. Um, really, it's only John of the disciples who was there. <laughs> the only one. He was the only one there mm-hmm. with Jesus till the end. And uh, you're getting a phone call. Hey, at least yours didn't go off, or yours didn't make noise like mine did. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, so don't beat yourself up. Repentance means change. So just do better. You know, that's I mean, that's what it comes down to. That's ask for forgiveness, turn and do better. Well, it means a little more than change. It it, it means go the opposite direction. Yeah, right. One a one eighty change. You're mm-hmm. you're you're turning away from whatever thing you shouldn't be doing. Right. So make because that- I because I can go. Here's a great illustration to, as we close. Because I I may not be able to do like caffeinated coffee, and I might I might have to just give up coffee. But you know what? If I just change, I can go to decaf and still have coffee. When really, what I have to do is just give it all up. Now that's not for me. <laughs> just saying. But the day right, you give so, up coffee is the day know, that uh, the world would better fly. <laughs> the world better be over. <laughs> if, that but, might be the sign of the sign of the end times. So so let me just wrap up this thing. Um, because here, here it is. Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament on how he was coming, that he was coming, the things that were going to happen are going to happen, and and it all. This verse, um, we're going to talk about this on, on Easter Sunday morning, uh, but it's John twelve verse fifteen. Mm. Um, it says, "Fear not, daughter of Zion." I love that. Fear not. Fear not. I mean, everything else going around you. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Us, okay? Because behold. Your king is coming, and he's coming because he's sitting on a donkey's colt. That's cool. He's coming, right? Now, that was then. When he's coming again, Scripture says he's coming back not on a donkey's colt. He's coming back on a horse 
a white horse as the king would come back into the city temple. And he's not going to wait for the palm branches, and he's not going to wait for the cloak. He's coming back. His sword is going to be there. Then he's going to judge the living and the dead. Exactly. So there's hope. Yeah, there's definitely hope. And hope. So uh, thank you for tuning in to our Easter episode. Um, we uh, w- This is my favorite time of the year. Obviously for the church, this is the biggest time of the year for any any church yep. across the country, across the world. Um, you have all of the churches focusing on one singular event at the exact same time, pretty much. Um, it's, it's a really cool thing to know that our brothers and sisters everywhere are going to be celebrating the same thing the next two Sundays. But... Um, but uh, in two weeks, when we come back uh, t- to the podcast, episode 21, what are we going to talk about? We didn't talk about that. We didn't. We have, had... we, have, we have a little way, a little ways to go. Okay, so we'll, we'll let you know uh, what uh, our next uh, podcast will be hey, about. Hey, actually, if you're watching this, why don't you send us something that you want us to talk about? That's a good idea. Yeah, so crowdsource. Is that, the lazy, is that the lazy way us to crowdsource what we no. need to talk about? No, it's being relevant. It's being relevant. There yeah, you go. It's being relevant. Yeah. So if you have an idea of what you would like us to discuss, um, we we can't promise that we'll do it, but you know, give us ideas at least, and uh, we'll we'll do our best to try and come up with a show. And if we don't do it in two weeks, maybe we do it in a few weeks if it's something we have to do some thought and research on, because <laughs> they may come up with things that we are like, uh... hey, well, let's just make it a little interesting. Because we're doing the whole theme as a church, we're filtered, Hebrews twelve two, filtered. Everything's filtered through the eyes of Jesus. Uh-huh. Um, if we use your idea, what can we give them? A coffee filter. A coffee filter. <laughs> hey, we will give you. I'm not going to give you a coffee filter because I need my coffee filters. <laughs> but we have Hermnaz stickers and window decals for your car. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll send it to you. Yep. We'll get we'll get your information. There you go. If we take your that's the best freebie I can give you. Yeah, sweet. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. And uh, this has been the morning burrito with Michael and Eric, and Eric and Michael. (laughs) Thank you to Anchor.fm for being our host for this show. Thank you to Facebook and YouTube and all the other avenues, Spotify and whatnot, that carry our podcast. We, after twenty episodes, just really appreciate the uh, support in that, and uh, we look forward to the future. And thanks, Herm Nass, for letting us do it. Yep. Have a great week. See you.